Much of Gaza is on fire because, well, there's a war going on that Hamas started. I feel terrible that the aid workers were killed. Um, but going into a war zone, well, there's a lot of risk in a war zone. This happens in every conflict. Innocent people are killed. It's one of the reasons why you only want to go to war if it's absolutely necessary. So I've been hearing about this a great deal. And of course, it is newsworthy and it was a tragedy. Uh, but again, it's a war that Hamas started. I have been hearing so much about, well, food in Gaza. I have not heard anything, anything about the women who were taken to Gaza by force by Hamas barbarians. Have you received an update about them? They're still in custody. That girl right there, Noah is her name. Noah Argamani, 25 years old. We got a glimpse of her in January. She's still in captivity. No one seems to be thinking about them anymore. And it's totally crazy. Hamas started this war. Israel's trying to finish it, and they should be allowed to do the job. And Israel could be even more danger, though, right now. We're, having, we're getting reports uh, from our correspondent in Israel that they believe an attack from Iran on Israel could be imminent. Uh, the Israel cabinet meeting, uh, they are canceling the leave of all their soldiers and calling pilots back. They've disabled their GPS. They're evacuating embassies across the Middle East and other places. This is, um, this is a big deal. Hopefully nothing, but it could be very, very bad. Iran has the capacity to do a lot, in large part, thanks to the Biden administration, the Obama administration, sending them so much money and capacity. All right, we are with Israel. Next, please. Tell me what is your name? MC Roll. That's true, he crossing his arms. He's rapping and a chilling and a showing his charm. He will do it or without fail. Get out his gun cause he's shooting quick. Yeah, MC Rove, Carl Rove having a great time at a White House correspondent's swamp party. Look at that dancing. That was uh, the brains behind George W. Bush. Yeah, they were really tight. Carl Rove and George W. Uh, these two put together the Iraq war. How about that one? Carl Rove and George W. Bush brought us the Iraq war. And there he is having a great time back in 2007. Well, he's back in the news because, you know, the Bushes, they don't like Trump. And at this stage in the game, well, we could use some support, not criticism. But Karl Rove reveals his true swamp colors yet again. If they were smart, they'd take the January 6th and go hard at it. And they would say, he wants to pardon these people who attacked our capital. I worked in that building as a young man. To me, the Congress of the United States is one of the great examples of the strength of our, of our democracy and a jewel of the Constitution. And what those people did when they violently attacked the Capitol in order to stop a constitutionally mandated meeting of the Congress to accept the results of the Electoral College is a stain on our history. And every one of those sons of who did that, we ought to find them, try them, and send them to jail. Sounds like Merrick Garland. There was a lot of pushing and shoving on January 6th and a lot of other weird things I'll get to in a moment. But this is what is happening right now. This is the Republican Party for you. One of the reasons we like President Trump is he tells the truth about January 6th and he doesn't fall for all this fake news hysteria. But the Bush team certainly does. One of the critical mistakes made in this campaign is that Donald Trump has now said, I'm going to pardon those people because they're hostages. No, they're not. They're thugs. There were people, some of them had automatic weapons at a hotel in Virginia hoping to be able to be called up. We had people saying, where's Nancy Pelosi? We had people who were, you know, taking desks and sitting at the desk of the Speaker of the House and attempting to, you know, find people in order to bring them to justice and saying to the, to the yelling at the police, kill them, kill them all. And so why Trump has done this is beyond me. Oh, my goodness. Somebody said Nancy Pelosi. Somebody put their feet up on Nancy Pelosi's desk. Yeah, 
a guy I kind of consider a friend. I've never met him, but I've interviewed a few times, uh, Big O Barnett. They've ruined this guy's life. Try to over that moment. He didn't break into the Capitol. He was allowed in. A lot of people were. All right, one more from Karl Rove because he's really starting to annoy me. I'm a Republican. I don't want to have a Democrat president. I want to have a Republican president. But we're facing as a country a decision, and you know, everybody gets to make it, as to what kind of leadership we're going to have. And to me, it is a mistake on the part of the Trump campaign to allow the president's impulses to identify himself with the people who assaulted the Capitol rather than people who stand for law and order. Yeah. Impulses, his judgment, his kind of, he, he doesn't succumb, President Trump, to the ordinary pressures of the swamp and media. He's not forgetting people like Ashley Babbitt. We saw what happened to her. We saw the police officer, the little cop, I call it, waving people on. What about that? These are not all thugs, these people who are following the directions of the police. What about the police that were just standing there? These people who are walking in are not all criminals and thugs. Many of them, I believe, are victims. And those police officers who, for some who knows what reason, decided to stop guarding the House of Representatives at the key moment and allow all hell to break loose. And Ashley Babbitt was killed seconds later. There's so much we don't know, so many unanswered questions. And the real tragedy here in Washington, D.C., Karl Rove and his friends, they haven't even asked. They haven't even bothered. Thank goodness for Clay Higgins, though, Republican of Louisiana. He knows what's up. Confidential human sources dressed as Trump supporters inside the Capitol on January the 6th prior to the doors being opened? Again, I had to be very careful. It should be I a can... no. Can you not tell the American people no? We did not have confidential human sources dressed as Trump supporters positioned inside the Capitol. Gentlemen, this time has expired. You should not read anything into my decision uh, Mr. not to share information. Director Ray, confidential human gentlemen's sources. time has expired. He was so mad. He couldn't say out loud that there weren't FBI personnel inside the Capitol dressed as Trump supporters. The thought never even occurred to me that there were until he wouldn't deny it. We don't know. We don't know a lot about that day. I do know this, though. It's blown totally out of proportion. We weren't born yesterday, okay? January 6th. Let's take a look at January 6th for a moment. Okay, that's Black Lives Matter. Let's take another look at January 6th. Hmm, okay, a guy yelling. Uh, and looting taking place all over the country. Another January 6th, please. On the left, people climbing a uh, stone wall. Fires all over the place. You know, there weren't any fires on January 6th. Anyone notice that? Carl Rove, did you notice that? No, you just bought the fake news version of it all, right? Having the time of your life there. This man, it's amazing that he can show his face in public, quite frankly, an architect of the Iraq war. He, I do believe, helped put W up to it. All right. Mar-a-Lago this weekend. Uh, it's going to be a huge event. Could raise $43 million. Hosted by uh, John Paulson, a billionaire, but from what I'm told, a great guy. Uh, started with nothing and then became a billionaire, and he is so invested in free speech. You know, it's not like one of these guys who just sits back and just never takes risks or never puts his name out there. He wrote a letter to the principal of some fancy private school that was trying to make the girls hate themselves because they were white. I mean, there's crazy stuff going on and guys like that are stepping up and it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, can I mention this also about Mar-a-Lago? Donald Trump, here he is in Mar-a-Lago. People forget that he had that house all the way since the 1980s. Here's another picture of President Trump in Mar-a-Lago. This points out that President Trump did not, like, gain much from the presidency. He had all of this stuff, right, ahead of time. He didn't become president to get it. Get it? All right. And this house, by the way, is very, very nice. Uh, it's been documented. It's the kind of place a thousand Italian guys died building. Hand-carved doorways, a curving, hand-carved grand staircase that Clark Gable could have carried a girl down. A library fit for a Carnegie or Bernard Baruch, someone like that. 
and a ballroom. Can't forget the ballroom. Well, Mar-a-Lago sounds uh, really nice, right? It's not Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> that description you just heard, not Mar-a-Lago. It's actually a description of Joe Biden's house that he bought in 1974. That's what that guy was just summarizing. That's how elaborate the home was that 34-year-old Scranton Joe bought. How did he buy it? And you know what he was living in just four years prior? Four years prior, Joe inhabited this place. He was renting it. Yeah. Um, I don't think it was that dilapidated back then, but obviously it's kind of modest. He goes from that into a literal palace. Something is totally up with the Bidens, and we all know it. You know, this whole middle class thing, mm -mm. Uh, one of Hunter's, well, Hunter's first wife, Kathy, actually made an observation about the Bidens, and, uh, well, it's in her book, which hasn't received enough attention, actually. Hunter tried to tell me that he came from a middle class family but nothing about his life looked remotely middle class to me. Months later, when I went to his house for the first time, I explained to him that the middle class families I knew didn't live like this, let alone working class families like mine. Hunt, I told him, a kid from a middle class family does not have a ballroom. But Joe Biden managed to get himself a ballroom when he was 34 years old. And the poorest man in the Senate. I forgot about that part. Take a look at this. I was listed for all the years I was a senator as the poorest man in the United States Congress. I had the dubious distinction of being listed as the poorest man in Congress for 36 years. I had the great pleasure of being listed as the poorest man in Congress for 36 years. It doesn't really add up, does it? <laughs> I know some of that stuff uh, was post-vice presidency, but he went right into an amazing home. Look, this is what they all do it for. The cookups, the connections, the access to info that they can capitalize on, I do believe. Hey, Joe Biden made it a federal case, didn't he? The whole thing with his daughter's diary. Um, you heard about this, right? So Ashley Biden is his 40-something-year-old daughter. And um, like a lot of people, she's got issues. Who doesn't have issues, right? She wrote about him in a diary. And unfortunately, well, she left the diary in a house that she was renting in Florida and forgot about it. Uh, somebody found it and kind of like a finder's keepers thing, right? Uh, well, not exactly. Uh, somebody went through the diary. I don't know if it was Miss Harris or somebody close to her and saw it. This is dynamite stuff. Uh, details about the Biden family. They went by the Trump campaign and the Trump people wanted nothing to do with it. So ultimately, it wound up on a website. I don't know if uh, anyone made a lot of money for it, but they're actually trying to nail the people who first found the diary. They're recommending uh, one of them get four to 10 months in prison, in prison um, for, I think, moving the diary across state lines. They made it a federal case. Crazy, crazy. They also confirm that the diary is authentic, that it's really Ashley's. A lot of us weren't 100% sure. You know, I personally think that the uh, answers to all of Ashley Biden's issues, if she still has them, are found not in the book that she writes, but in a book that's already been written by God. I hope she sees this. There's hope. I'll be right back.